Hey guys, welcome back. This is the story about what if Naruto was a hollow. Before we start, please subscribe to the channel and like the video as well, it really means a lot. So let's start the what if. After Naruto and Okuyora flashed away from the scene, Orihime and Neliel were left alone with the rapidly hollowfying Ichigo. While his mask rapidly formed, an unbelievable pressure was washing off of Ichigo in waves. The two girls almost gagged on the choking and oppressive red and black riatsu that was pouring from Ichigo's body. The room was silent for a moment, and then Ichigo gave a loud, inhuman shriek as he clutched his hands to his forehead in pain. His mask was materializing without his will, his orange hair was growing longer down his back into what almost resembled a lion's mane. Kurosaki, Kuin, Orihime managed to stutter out despite herself. Neliel admittedly was faring much better than the weaker human girl, and she had the sense to back away from Ichigo. Orihime reached out to touch the hollifying boy, an action that surely would have been suicidal. The Riatsu pricked her hand, causing her to squeak lightly. No! Get away from him! Neliel warned, as Orihime pulled her hands away completely, but otherwise didn't move. Orihime continued to sit there, stunned. She didn't even register the presence of the much older green-haired Eren Carr in her released state who was there with her. Neliel once again yelled at the girl, and Orihime once again stood there in shock. The boy that was once a Shinigami was changing into something far more hideous before her very eyes, and she couldn't take it. She began shaking, hugging herself, trying in any way to use her own body as a comfort device. What are you doing? Get out, Neliel cried, but she was cut off. Kurosaki Ichigo was now standing up, and to top it all off, directly behind her. He had slipped underneath her pesquisa. How? She asked out loud, as the creature was growling at her forcefully. Neliel knew the orange-haired Shinigami that was Ichigo, and this was not it. This creature bore an exact resemblance to a hollow. The new hollow Ichigo bore no resemblance to human Ichigo except for the fact that he had orange hair. He was covered in a mask that slightly resembled the one in his visored state, but this one had two long horns jutting out of either side of his head. Stripes ran down the mask, and five more identical stripes were running from the hole in the chest, which continued to become hollowed out with Riatsu. His body was the chalk white of hollow mask, his hands and feet were adorned with claws, and a few clumps of what looked like faux hair were concentrated on his shoulders and his ankles. His expression was blank, and his posture didn't look like it was ready to kill. Ichigo. Neliel said blankly. She was breathing a little heavier, and Ichigo stared down at her, finally giving some kind of indication that he was listening. He then turned his head up, seeing the heads of Chad and Kakashi lying on the ground a distance away. He growled louder, but underneath the mask one couldn't see whether or not his face changed. A billow of steam emerged from underneath his mask, and he then released a devastating roar of anger, his body glowing with red riatsu. His clenched fist opened, and his black sunpakuto flew towards him from across the room he grasped the flying blade roughly, swinging it horizontally in the process. He swung it downward, the blade charged with a heavy riatsu. A second later, and the ground and wall of the section of the building behind him had collapsed into pieces, exploding outward. That seemed to jolt Orihime right out of her shock, and she cried out as the force of the blow pushed her off to the side. Neliel winced, but regained her bearings. Hopefully, he wouldn't turn his rampage on her. He can clearly use Shuenpa in that state. I have to be on guard, and... She was cut off from her thoughts, as Ichigo flashed out of his existence, slipping through her pesquisa once again and appearing right behind her. The flashing movement didn't make a whooshing sound that time. Instead, it was reminiscent of a boom and static. What? But, that was Sonido, she couldn't help but think, as Ichigo mindlessly swung his blade at her with an incredible amount of force. The sound barrier broke as Neliel got her lance up just in time to block it, the force of the strike almost jarring her weapon from her hand. The air conjured up by the blade created a torrent that displaced the rubble around the room. More of the building began to crumble underneath Ichigo's spiritual pressure alone. He roared again, 
before he oriented his horns directly at Neliel. Stop it, Ichigo. It's me, it's Nell, she cried, trying to appeal to the Shinigami within the hollow. Alas, Ichigo seemed to be completely deaf to her pleas, as a red and white Ciro appeared on the tip of his horns. It took less time to charge than normal, and before she knew it, an absurdly powerful Ciro was blasted straight from Ichigo's horns directly towards Neliel. Neliel's instant reaction was to try and absorb it, but she then realized the sheer strength of the Ciro. An explosion of flames engulfed the former Tercera. The smoke began to clear, before Neliel stumbled out of the blast, panting and gasping for breath. Her body was badly singed. Lanzador Verde, she gasped out with lungfuls of soot. She prepared to throw her lance, but Ichigo appeared within her guard yet again and grasped her right arm with a bone-crushing force. His black blade twirled in the air as he prepared to slice off the former Tercera's arm. Before he could do so, a golden, triangular shield suddenly appeared in front of the holified Ichigo. He shattered it easily with his sword, but it prevented him from severing Neliel's arm. The female Arankar used the opportunity to flash away before Ichigo could recover and attack again. Over to the side, Orihime had focused her shield over Neliel, a look of determination set upon her face. Her clothes were in tatters, and her face was dirty, but she looked ready to try and reach Ichigo. Kurosaki-kun. She said again. Tears pricked at her eyes, and Ichigo flashed over to her, holding his blade at arm's length. He was ready to attack her. Chad, dead. Underneath the hollow exterior, a raspier, deeper version of Ichigo's voice muttered those two words over and over again. Occasionally, he mentioned Kakashi, but Chad's name rang true. He angled his blade at Orihime's death, not being able to tell friend from foe in his blind vengeance. Orihime froze in fear, she hadn't been this up close to the holified Ichigo, and for the first time she could truly see how terrifying his visage was. Ichigo tightened the grip on his blade, before he let loose another roar. Orihime screamed, and placed her hands over her ears, her eardrums threatening to burst under the loud noise. Ichigo drew his sword to the side, apparently ready to slice clean through Orihime. Even if she wasn't petrified with fear, the blade was coming down far too fast for her to ever avoid it. A surge of blue riatsu in the form of an arrow flew by, knocking the blade clean out of Ichigo's hand. Ichigo growled a little louder, before he turned his attention away from Orihime. Another blue arrow flew towards Ichigo's body, but it bounced uselessly off his extraordinarily tough skin. That only served to make Ichigo even angrier, and he held his sword out in the direction of the new arrival. Ina-san, cried a voice. One second later, an Ishida Yuryu had appeared next to the downed Orihime, and with a few agile steps of Hirenkiyaku, had moved her out of harm's way, just before Ichigo's blade crashed into the ground, creating a large crater where Ishida was before. Ishida-kun. Orihime whispered, as she was picked up and moved courtesy of Ishida. The bespectacled Quincy looked at the orange-haired girl, before he narrowed his eyes and faced Ichigo. Ishida-kun. Kurosaki-kun is. Yeah, I know. I came as soon as I felt Sato-kun and Kakashi-san's Riatsu disappear. I can tell already that Kurosaki lost his mind and entered a rampage because of that. Ishida explained. He looked away from Ichigo, noticing the wounded Neliel. He turned back to Ichigo again, and pulled back on his bow, thoroughly ready to engage Ichigo in battle. Ulquiora's eyes narrowed as he and Naruto sonidoed through the sands of Los Noches. Naruto flashed ahead of the Quinta Espada, coming down to rest on a collapsed pillar. Ulquiora landed right beside him. Amazing! Kurosaki Ichigo's Riatsu continues to increase. The fact that he was hiding such a state never fails to amaze me. Ulquiora commented. He remembered how disappointing Ichigo was in battle to him, it didn't really make sense that he would be hiding such a powerful state. He's not actually in control of that state, Ulquiora. It's obvious that his heightened emotional state in response to his friend's death triggered some kind of hollow that exists within him. Naruto stated. If I may ask, Naruto, 
What was the point of having Kurosaki Ichigo take on such a form? It appears to be doing nothing more than causing trouble for Lost No Chase, Olquiora said. Naruto looked back at the dome where Kurosaki had transformed. Another explosion of dust and Ryatsu was occurring over there, this time by none other than Nelio. Control, Olquiora. You said it yourself, there was a high possibility that the kid's power could destroy him someday. That day happened to be today. If we can keep that Palo on a leash, then our own power will inevitably increase, we can better fight the Soul Society this way, Naruto explained. He gestured to the throne room of Los Noches, where the portal to Karakura Town was being opened. That gateway is to Karakura Town in the human world, which is not our destination. However, a gateway like that will also be used to enter Soul Society from Karakura Town. I'm having Sale analyze the data on that portal as we speak, so we may invade Soul Society at our leisure. Naruto stopped at another pillar along the plain, Olquiora once again mimicking him. He lifted his hand gingerly, absent-mindedly noticing that it was far different from when he was a Vasto Lorde. Olquiora, have you noticed anything strange about our Arankar forms, he said, more to himself than to Olquiora. Olquiora was likely getting what he was saying. Yes, I have. Olquiora said. Right, ever since our evolution into Arankar all those years ago, I can't help but feel that the transformation was never worth it. The evolution into Arankar was supposed to help us gain greater power, but the Bola de Evolution has only minimally increased our powers from when we were Vasto Lorde, Naruto explained. Perhaps the Hugyoka created Arankar are different? Olquiora mused. Perhaps. Perhaps not. Back when I still ruled the Reno animal, I had Sale perform some medical tests on Ryatsu, Ryurioku, and DNA, while doing more tests on the Bola de Evolution. The maximum capacity that the Bola can arankarize is grievously low. Let me give you an example. Naruto mused. Okuyora raised an eyebrow. Since I became an Arankar, my Ryatsu and DNA is 96.94% hollow, and a mere 3.06% Shinigami. I am far from a perfect Arankar, and I am possibly the most perfect Arankar that can be created using the Bola de Evolution. Theoretically, a perfect 50% hollow 50% Shinigami hybrid should be impossible to create, but the Hugyoku should at least be more powerful than the Bola de Evolution. Naruto said. But, that is incorrect. Sale also ran some tests on a Hugyoku created Arankar a few months ago, but its level of Ryatsu was about the same percentage as my own. 96% Hollow and 4% Shinigami. Similarly, the level of power that was gained via the Hugyoku was fairly minuscule. Why would this be, when the Hugyoku is such a more powerful instrument? Naruto wondered. They flashed away again, and this time Aizen's personal chambers were in sight. The portal to Karakura town would be at the very top, but Naruto was going to climb the tower and kill Aizen before he could begin this ridiculous little war. The answer is simple, Olquiora. Aizen has probably the most powerful tool ever known to both Hollow and Shinigami, and he's preventing the full usage of it. In other words, he's holding back our true potential. He claimed. He continued to explain. A few months ago, Aizen created the most advanced Shinigami Hollow hybrid in Tosen Kanin. Just a few days ago, he created Wonderwise using the Hugyoku, who is the most advanced Arankar thus far. But, Wonderwise is a special Arankar. Aizen needs to have him powerful in order to be able to face the old man in combat and eliminate his Zanpakuto. The fact that Aizen removed Wonderwise rational thinking is because he doesn't want the Arankar to become too advanced regardless of what Soul Society believes on this matter. This is proof that Aizen has the capability to advance the Arankar even farther, but he doesn't. He said sagely, looking at Olquiora, who was holding on to every word. He knows that he needs to keep us in check, have our powers limited. The 10 Espada right now have a collective power inferior to that of the 13 captains, and not just due to numbers. Aizen simply wants us to be able to fight the captains, not triumph over them. He wants to make sure that our power is limited in case we rebel. 
Six of the Espada, including myself, were a part of the Reino animal. I'm sure he's aware of the fact that we're working against him. He might even be expecting us in the throne room right now. A few minutes later, and Naruto and Okuyora had touched down directly in front of the entrance to the large tower, where at the top they would find Aizen, as well as Jin and Tosin most likely. Are you ready? Okuyora asked. Naruto grinned at him. He fiddled with his Zanpakuto for a little while, making sure it was secure on his hip. Of course, Aizen won't know what hit him. While I'm taking care of the bastard himself, all you have to do is hold off Ikimaru and Tosin if they happen to be there. Sail of course is working on the portal, I've got Grimjow and Neutra causing a ruckus in Lost No Chase in approximately 5 minutes, and Haribel should be on her way to provide backup. Naruto explained. And the other Espada? Okuyora asked. I'm sending Haribel to greet with Stark, but he's more than likely in the know about this incident already. Berrigan won't be too happy seeing me in charge, but he should have no problems about getting rid of Aizen. That leaves Zamari and Yami. Yami will follow you regardless, but he won't like it when he gets demoted back to Decima. We might have to beat his bitch ass. Zamari though is very loyal to Aizen. We may just have to kill and replace him, but hopefully he makes it through the change without causing a ruckus. That's unlikely. Okuyora snarked. Naruto smirked at him, but Okuyora didn't see it, as Naruto's face became dimmed after the two Arankar had entered the dull lighting of the staircase. Here we go, Okuyora. Naruto said dramatically, as the staircase spiraled ever upward towards the chamber directly above the throne room, where the portal to Karakura town was. The two Arankar walked through the entryway into the wide room. They walked down the aisle designated by the lack of pillars, before Naruto spotted the distortion of space at the top of the final staircase. Blue skies and human buildings, it was a legitimate portal to Karakura town. Naruto then noticed the presence of three Riatsis at the top of the stairs. So, they're all here. Okuyora, looks like you're going to have to handle Ikimaru and Tosin. You'd better not disappoint me. Naruto thought to himself. The three former captains had their backs turned to them, but they were clearly aware of their presence. Aizen breathed in deeply, before he addressed the two intruders. Welcome. Naruto, Okuyora. May I ask what the two of you are doing here? Aizen asked affably. Naruto sneered in hatred at the Shinigami, releasing his orange Riatsu to its fullest extent. You know exactly why I'm here, Aizen. True. I've known since the day I met you that you would attempt to kill me, likely at a pivotal moment like this. It's all a part of your nasty behavior, Hollow. The desire to rule is ingrained deeply within you, and you cannot stand the fact that I stripped you of your kingdom. Similar to Berrigan's situation, and although I expected a rebellion from him as well, I always knew you were by far the most violent, brutal, passionate and emotional of all my Arankar. You were the most likely to betray me in the end, betray anyone who was superior to you. That's why your aspect of death is just that, betrayal. Aizen turned away from the gateway to Karakura town, and his commanders followed suit. He walked down the steps smoothly, while Tosin gripped his Zanpakuto, ready to draw it. What I didn't expect however, that you would go along with this, Olquiora. I clearly underestimated your loyalty for your old commander, and it seems that none of it transferred to me, Aizen said. Okuyora said nothing. You'd be surprised, Aizen. I've got four more Espada on my side with this. Your army is in tatters, Naruto said. For the first time, Aizen looked a little bit bothered. It seems we are going to be entering battle without two of our Espada. No matter, we have enough power to defeat the Godii 13 anyway. Jin. Kanaim, we are going to kill these two quickly, and then go meet our enemies, Aizen ordered. The other two captains nodded, but Tosin was looking restless. He had drawn his Zanpakuto ahead of everyone else, and looked even more agitated than usual. Aizen Sama, please allow me to end his life, he shouted, drawing his sword and pointing it at Naruto. Aizen frowned at Kanaim, who balked underneath Aizen's gaze. No, Kanaim. 
I will be the one to fight Naruto. You and Jin make sure to kill Okuyora. This should not take long. Aizen said. Jin and Tosin nodded in underneath, and they leaped down the staircase past Naruto, over to where Okuyora stood behind the scenes. Aizen had already drawn his Zanpakuto, Kyuka Suijetsu gleaming in the light. He regarded his opponent, and then let a smooth and cool smile enter his face. You're taking this so seriously. I would have thought you wouldn't need to dirty your hands, Naruto mocked. Aizen knew that Jin and Tosin would be no match for him. Hopefully, Okuyora could at least hold his own against the two of them until he was finished. Though. He said, letting his smile drift into a lazy smirk. He twisted his body towards the left, placing his left hand underneath his hip, while his right hand grasped the red hilt of his Zanpakuto. He drew his cutlass-like Zanpakuto from its sheath slowly, the blade obscuring some of his face. He grinned as he pulled the tip out, before he pointed the saber at Aizen. I'm not going to mess around here either, he grinned. The gleam of Naruto's sword matched that of Aizen's. Aizen eyed the Zanpakuto in admiration, even as he held his own sword in its ready position. You're going to use your Zanpakuto, Naruto. That's a rare occurrence. Though, I can see that you have no intention of releasing your Zanpakuto. You can't hope to defeat me without it. Aizen said. Are you sure? I can see that you have no intention of using your Bankai. That is, if you even have it in the first place. Naruto taunted, remembering the powers of Kyuka Suijetsu. Aizen smiled a little more and released his Ryatsu, before he disappeared with Shuenpa. Naruto matched the speed with Sonido, and their two blades met each other halfway. The arrow that Ishida fired once again bounced uselessly off of the sturdy mask armor that Ichigo was wearing. The action only seemed to make the transformed Shinigami angrier, and he rushed Ishida at a rate the Quincy couldn't even hope to follow. Ichigo grasped his wrist tightly, and before anyone could blink, his blade flashed vertically over Ishida's wrist. The Quincy cried out in pain as his right hand was severed completely, making his bow useless. Kurosaki-kun. Ishida-kun, your hand, Orihime said, as Ishida skidded right past her. Despite one stump of a hand, he used his remaining left one to pull a seal schneider from his belt. He twirled the Quincy blade on his finger, before he held it like a sword. He couldn't fire it, so this was his only option. It's alright. I've already stopped the bleeding. More importantly, Inu-san, you need to get out of here quickly. Kurosaki can't tell friend from foe in this case. Ishida said. But, but. Ishida-kun, Inu protested, as Ishida stopped kneeling and got to his feet. It's okay, Inu-san. I'll hold him off somehow, Ishida said with an air of finality. The teenager looked over, and noticed Neliel standing a good distance away. The errand car flashed over, and Ishida raised an eyebrow. You are... Nel-chan, he asked in shock, noticing the several similarities between Nel and the adult, buxom woman that now stood before him. Neliel smiled lightly. Yes. You are, different than I remember, Ishida said lamely. Neliel's smile turned sad. Well, let's just say, because of a very emotional event, I was able to regain my true form. But, ever since that happened, Ichigo has gone out of control. I'm not strong enough to stop him, even in my resurrection, Neliel commented. What should we do, then? Ishida asked. Neliel stood tall and strong holding her lance ahead of her. She looked at the part where Ichigo had struck his blade. It was cracked badly, which meant that her lance wouldn't last much longer. Right now, we just have to hold him off. Prevent him from moving to another part of Los Noches, and see if we can somehow return him to normal. That's the only chance we have right now, she said. Ishida nodded. I guess that is what we're going to have to do, he conceded, testing the seal schneider in his hand. He was not a swordsman, by any means, so he didn't know how long he would last. Ichigo swung his sword one last time, and that seemed to be the breaking point for the building. 
It had taken too much damage in the various fights that had occurred in the vicinity, and when a powerful rampaging hollow on the loose, it was enough. The building collapsed, pieces of rubble jarring both sides of the conflict and preventing them from exchanging blows once again. Neliel grabbed Orihime and placed her across her back, while Ishida leaped to avoid the falling rubble. Neliel followed suit, but Ichigo didn't think properly enough to avoid the rubble, and he fell along with the building. A few seconds later, and the group of three reappeared outside, as the building collapsed on Ichigo. They knew it wouldn't be able to keep him down for long though, and what had just happened gave him the perfect opportunity to rampage across Los No Chase. The building exploded into dust, and when the smoke cleared Ichigo was standing there, looking completely unharmed. He drew his sword to him again, turning in the opposite direction of where the company was. Apparently, he couldn't sense anyone's Ryatsu in that state, so now he was just mindlessly rampaging, looking for a target. Something to take his anger out on. Nelio looked stricken. We need to stop him, before he destroys all of Los No Chase at this rate. The blades of Aizen and Naruto met, and a torrent of air and Ryatsu blasted the vicinity. In terms of raw strength, the two of them were unmatched. They used a Ryatsu that was almost otherworldly, and their attacks were so strong that they almost caused in a ripple in the space around them. Naruto ground his blade against Aizen's, trying to knock the blade out of his hands. But Aizen's grip was too strong, and he managed to turn the attack back on Naruto all too easily. Amazing! Every time I see either one of them in battle, I can hardly believe my eyes. Ulquior amused, as the two combatants flashed several times, their blades meeting once again as they tried to outspeed one another. Naruto was faring much better in this department. Aizen's Ryatsu was pure, controlled, and it sucked the life out of anyone not strong enough to resist. But Naruto's was so turbulent, wild, and powerful that he seemed to outclass the ruler of Los No Chase in pure Ryatsu, and his Sonido seemed to trump Aizen's Shunpa ever so slightly. Despite this, the Shinigami had his own advantages. He could read Naruto's attacks better than Naruto could read his, and overall seemed to be better in swordsmanship. It was an even battle in a whole new way, though neither opponent seemed worried. Naruto's trying to outclass him in sheer power. For once, he isn't trying to trick his opponent. He knows that Aizen is unlikely to fall for such tactics at his level of skill. Ulquiora analyzed. The two were still trying to outspeed each other, and Ulquiora could barely see the combat as they seemed to flash in and out of existence in split-second intervals. Aya, they're really going wild over there, aren't they? Ulquiora focused on Jin, the one who had just recently spoke. He was standing just opposite Ulquiora, with Tosin at his side, while both of their bosses dueled. Ulquiora narrowed his eyes, he was left to face the two former captains alone, at least until Haribel arrived with backup? That's enough, Ikimaru. These two are now considered traitors. For Aizen-sama's sake. Tosin said beside him, though he trailed off as he placed a hand on his blade. He drew it quickly, angling it as he pointed the sword at Ulquiora. We must eliminate them, he said zealously. Jin looked at Tosin, the smile of course, never fading from his face. He never made a move to draw his Sanpakuto, but instead placed a hand on the back of his head. If you say so, Tosin-san. Would you mind going ahead of me? I don't feel too comfortable fighting, a guy who's supposed to be our comrade, so I'll just sit this one out. You should be more than enough for him anyway, especially with that. Ikimaru said casually. Naruto and Aizen's fight was the only noise that could be heard, as Tosin stared blankly at Jin with his blind eyes the tension could be cut with a knife. Very well, he said finally, realizing that he wasn't going to get any help on this one. Ulquiora mimicked Tosin, drawing his blade lightning fast and holding it at his side. You may be a commander of Los No Chase, but that doesn't mean you're above the Espada in terms of combat ability. Ulquiora said. Tosin said nothing, and only stared at Ulquiora in scrutiny. He slashed his sword to the side, before he held it at a 90 degree angle to his right. Ulquiora raised an eyebrow, he knew that stance. Cry, Suzumushi, he stated, 
before a black and white wave emanated from his Sanpakuto and spread out over the area. Ulquiora closed his eyes and released his Riatsu. Tosin Shirkai was trying to override his hearing and knock him unconscious. He heard a high-pitched buzzing noise, but his Riatsu deafened it to him, and Tosin Shirkai was rendered ineffective. Ulquiora's eyes snapped open as he felt Tosin move, and his blade moved up just in time to block Tosin's, which was once again in its sealed state. Ulquiora pulled back for a split second, charging Riatsu into his blade. He then thrust his sword forward in a flurry of quick jabs, Riatsu shooting off from every stab. Tosin avoided them all deftly, swaying along with the attacks naturally as if he wasn't even blind. When Ulquiora paused in his assault, Tosin thrust forward, his blade angled straight for a stab into Ulquiora's head. Ulquiora's blade shot up on reflex, blocking the deadly attack. The two blades ground against each other, and Tosin roared in struggle. Ulquiora's feet caved into the ground, as the former captain pushed the Quinta Espada back further and further, until Ulquiora's back was up against the wall. Tosin mimicked his stance when he had released his Shirkai earlier, but this time he also wrapped his blade around the front side of his head. A blur of illusionary blades created a trail, all of them pointed at Ulquiora. Suzumushi Nishiki, Benahiko. Tosin cried, as Ulquiora was pinned against the wall. The illusionary blades materialized into solid shapes, all pointed horizontally at Ulquiora. The hundreds of blades flew forward at a ludicrous speed, impacting the wall, and going directly through it like it was butter. Ulquiora flashed away, just in time, and Tosin narrowed his blind eyes. From behind. He thought, as he swung his blade upward. It met against metal, as Ulquiora appeared in midair, and tried to attack Tosin's backside. The stoic Espada put his other hand on his blade, creating more force as he began to push through Tosin's defense. Tosin noticed this as his blade was getting cut through, and he lurched to the left. Ulquiora retracted one hand from his blade, keeping the momentum as his blade swung down and left him open. Despite that, he used his free arm to charge up a Ciro, deflecting the strike from Aizen and initiating a counterattack that put Tosin on edge. Tosin bounced away from the Espada, allowing Ulquiora to turn the tides and go on the offensive. His hard, fast, and heavy blows were clearly too much for a sealed Tosin, but the former captain held his own anyway. All throughout this, neither combatant said absolutely anything. Jin was on the sidelines idly, watching the two battles take place with a passing degree of interest. Ulquiora was faring much better than he had expected. Tosin bit his lower lip, he was beginning to get frustrated. First, Jin wouldn't help him at all, and now he was being overwhelmed by someone he should have authority over. Being the Quinta Espada, Ulquiora was forbidden to release his Zanpakuto underneath the Dome of Los Noches, but the two rebelling Arankar had already disregarded the rules, so Tosin couldn't be sure that he wouldn't break that one either. He had tried his Shirkai on Ulquiora, which failed to affect the Arankar. He couldn't use his Bankai in such a closed space, it would either draw in both Aizen and Naruto, or there just wouldn't be enough space to perform it anyway. Which meant that he was left with one option. I'm surprised. Never in my wildest dreams would I imagine that I would be forced to use my newfound power before the battle even started. Tosin mused, as he put his hand to his face. Ulquiora's eyes widened slightly, he had seen that stance before. An explosion of deep purple Riatsu emerged from Tosin, so much that it made Naruto and Aizen halt in their battle. Naruto looked on as the smoke clear, and he growled in irritation. So, you did do that to him, after all, he mused. Aizen simply looked at him smugly. I knew you were holding out on the rest of US, he's a more perfect Hollow Shinigami hybrid, isn't he? You used the Hugyoku on him? Naruto asked. He didn't even need Aizen to answer him on that one. When the smoke cleared, a new and improved Tosin was standing, ready for battle. His braids hung loosely from a blank hollow mask that revealed no portion of his face. Oh, dear. Jin mused over to the side. Ulquiora narrowed his eyes, Tosin's Riatsu was much stronger than before. Ulquiora blinked, and Tosin was already in front of him, going in for a deadly downward slash that would no doubt be fatal. 
Okuyora grunted and brought his blade up to block the strike, the force making the blade clatter in his eyes as he awkwardly moved back. A faint ringing sound reverberated throughout the area. Tosin was using his shirkai on top of his holification. The espada disappeared in a split second, reappearing wherever it looked to be clear. Tosin was on his trail the entire time. Okuyora appeared in the awnings of the building, but Tosin also appeared directly above him, getting underneath his guard. He brought an elbow down on the espada. Okuyora grunted, his iero was holding up, but damage was still done. The force propelled him down to the ground, but before he could land in a crater, Tosin appeared before him, and kicked him upwards diagonally so he would fly into the opposite wall from where he came from. The wind pressure prevented Okuyora from regaining his stance, but at the last minute he was able to plant his feet on the wall and minimize the damage he had taken from that attack. Tosin appeared right before him with his sword at the ready, and sparks flew as Okuyora once again just barely blocked the attack. Tosin retaliated by shoving his blade forward in a thrust, going straight for Okuyora's brain. Okuyora shoved his hand out, redirecting the blade over to the side, despite the fact that he took some aminer injuries from touching the blade. The blade stabbed into the wall, breaking it and allowing chunks of marble or rock to fall to the floor. Okuyora counterattacked by stabbing his own blade forward. But the hollow-fied Tosin was prepared, he flipped over the blade using astonishing agility, and kicked Okuyora in the face. The recoil produced a crater in the back of the wall, which Okuyora was thrust into by the blow. Tosin flipped back into mid-air, before he rushed Okuyora with a jab that would no doubt impale him, even with his thick arrow. Okuyora disappeared away, planting his feet on an untouched portion of the wall near the corner of the room. He heard the whoosh of a shuinpa slash sonido from down below, and instinctively knew where Tosin would attack from next. Grasping the hilt of his zanpakuto, he swung the blade to the right as hard as he could, and as he followed through, it met with Tosin's own blade. Tosin wasn't prepared for that strike, and Okuyora was able to get underneath his guard completely, and lop off his left arm. Tosin, to his credit, didn't roar in pain and merely gave a slight flinch, though he retreated away from Okuyora, landing on the ground in front of Naruto and Aizen. Jin smirked during the whole ordeal. It would seem that your holification has not made you as powerful as you believed, Tosin, Okuyora said, not even mocking the former captain. It was as if he were stating a simple fact. Tosin held up his arm, an expression not being visible due to his blank mask. The stump that was his arm glowed with a little bit of Ryatsu, and after a few seconds, a new arm had appeared from where the old one had gotten cut off. Over to the side, Jin smirked wider as he realized that Tosin would likely need a little help against his foe in this state. He pulled a hand out of his long sleeves, and grasped the hilt of his Zanpakuto. His wrist was grabbed by a powerful grip before he could even think to draw it, and a blade was placed against his neck faster than he could react to properly. Ah, sorry, Aizen Taishu, Tosin-san, it would appear that I got caught again. Jin said casually, as his assailant tightened their grip on his wrist. Jin panned his eyes upward, and could make out the form of Tia Haribel standing directly behind him. Aizen lowered his blade, before bringing it back up to block another of Naruto's strikes. He looked at Haribel dispassionately, before bringing the same look towards Jin. It doesn't matter, he said finally. How many of the Espada are going to betray La Snow Chase? Tosin asked, anger tinging into his voice at yet another betrayal by an Espada, a relatively high one at that. Six, but I'm on my way to getting the rest of them on my side, Naruto said, answering Tosin's question. That seemed to arouse a little bit of suspicion within Aizen, as he finally realized that his followers weren't quite so loyal. Tosin grit his teeth, and his Sanpakuto shook in his hand. A loud noise emanated from his mask, and the hollow material began to crack, until Tosin's mouth was visible underneath the entire thing. The deep purple Ryatsu covered his body once again, and he raised his sword before tilting it downward. Then I will bring those traitorous Espada to justice for the sake of Aizen-sama, using my Resurrection. Tosin said zealously, as he channeled the purple energy into his blade. Naruto and Okuyora's eyes widened at his words. Resurrection. What the fuck? Naruto roared, 
in mixture of both surprise and anger. Tosin's masked face didn't give any indicators on whether or not that was true, but the Riatsu was similar to an Erenkar's sword release. I am above all the Espada. I will now put an end to this pointless rebellion so we may go on to Karakura town uninhibited. Tosin remarked, as his Riatsu peeked. Suzumushi Hayakushi, he shouted. Griller Grillo, he finished. A dark purple void of Riatsu engulfed Tosin, and even Naruto narrowed his eyes at the sheer density of the energy. The Riatsu was practically viscous, covering Tosin like some sort of sludge. But the sludge began to take shape and solidify into a form. Wisps of the stuff thinned out until they became insect legs, with long and sharp digits jutting out from the ends. Despite being an insect, the new Tosin was hairy, with two antennae sticking out of his back, and short fly wings emerging just below them. Tosin lifted his face to regard Olquiora, an insectoid mask covering all but his mouth. The most striking thing about the Resurrection were the round, bulbous eyes of the mask, which were currently closed. Carefully, Tosin opened them, showing a concave orange scara, with an almost shaped green pupil in the center. Olquiora regarded it dispassionately. It was hideous, but as a hollow he had seen things far uglier than an overgrown bug. However, it didn't take long for Tosin to speak, in a much higher unnatural voice. I can see. He said, as he noticed all eyes were on him. I can see. I can see. I can see. Tosin guffawed, as he lost all sense of himself. This is the world. This is lost no chase. This is an Erenkar, he shouted, turning his head towards Olquiora, before turning it around to where Jin was. And that is a Shinigami. I can see, he finally cut off his rambling to turn to where Olquiora was. The Espada was looking dispassionately at him, in spite of the overwhelming advantage Tosin had in his release. And I assume, you are Olquiora? Tosin remarked. He flexed his claws, before getting into whatever battle stance he could perform when he was in that state. Olquiora continued to stare, almost like he was looking upon a pathetic creature. Surprisingly, instead of attacking, Olquiora sheathed his Sanpakuto. He closed his eyes and walked over to the side of the building, as if his job were done after that. What are you do, he asked, before he cut off by a powerful slash slicing right through the top of his head. Tosin gasped in pain and alarm, before he coughed up an unhealthy amount of blood, before he plummeted towards the ground. Olquiora blinked, and noticed that Naruto had taken a break in his battle with Aizen in order to practically scalp the top portion of Tosin's resurrected bug head. He smirked casually. You let your newfound sight go to your head, idiot. You couldn't even sense me coming from behind, just like. This, he cackled with glee, as Aizen went in for an opportunistic strike while Naruto was occupied. It was blocked easily. You can finish him off if you want, Olquiora. I've got to go back to handling this fuckhead, he shouted, as Olquiora sighed. He drew his sword again, and looked down at the fallen Tosin. He was barely conscious, and there were still a few remnants of his hollow powers that he had used before. All in all, he looked resigned to whatever had happened. Olquiora didn't even give him the chance to speak, and simply plunged his Zanpakuto into Tosin's brain, effectively ending the fight. Aha, looks like they got canning. The splattering of blood and brains could be heard in the hallway as Tosin's head was slashed open by Olquiora's blade, but it was almost drowned out by the fighting of Naruto and Aizen in the exact center of the room. Naruto grinned wildly as the serene look on Aizen's face never faded. The sound of death was pleasing to Naruto, but Aizen obviously wasn't even phased that one of his commanders had just been taken out. Looks like one of the commanders got taken out before we even reached the fighting. Ain't that going to be something to mess up your plans? Naruto goaded. Hardly. Aizen responded, pressing the attack back on Naruto. Naruto smirked as he flipped into the air, stabbed his sword downwards while blocking the upward strike from Aizen. I figured you'd say that. He swung his sword upward, getting into the momentum as he hovered in midair, before he launched a testing bala straight towards Aizen. The Shinigami backhanded the orange ball away. 
Bala? Surely you can attack me with something a little stronger than that. Aizen said, raising an eyebrow. Naruto responded by appearing in front of Aizen and slashing down on him. He brought his free hand up, and in a split second, had launched a bala. Aizen closed his eyes and casually tilted his head to the side, avoiding the bala easily. Naruto smirked. He adjusted the pressure on his sanpakuto with enough force to push Aizen back. Meanwhile, the bala had curved around just before it had hit the wall, pinning Aizen between a sword slash from ahead, and a bala from behind that honed in on him. Bala, Sigendo. A decent trick on a lower level opponent, but all too easy to figure out. He said, taking one hand off his blade and aiming it at the incoming bala. Had a number 33, Sokatsui. He said, as blue fire erupted from his fingertips and intercepted the bala on its way towards. However, while that was occurring, Naruto used both hands to push his blade onto Aizen's, getting closer to breaking through his defenses. Aizen smirked and drew back using Shunpa. However, Naruto's Sonido was slightly superior, so he was able to close to the distance on them very quickly and deliver a aminer slash to Aizen's shoulder. Too damn slow, he said. For the first time that day, Aizen lost the smug smile in favor of a slight frown. No one had managed to wound him in quite some time now. And using simple tactics too, it was just that Naruto's basic skills were ludicrously strong, that he could afford to use basic tactics like that and still overwhelm his opponent. Naruto wasn't quite done yet, though. He was pressuring Aizen the best he could, ramming his blade into Aizen's defenses, looking for a way he could follow up his successful attack. He used three successive slashes, which Aizen managed to recover and block quite easily. Aizen flashed away with Shunpa, and Naruto halted his advances in midair. He grinned and held his blade horizontally while charging up energy into his head. He placed his other hand in a similar position, though he pointed his fist to the right. When he was done, he had two charged up zeros waiting to be released. However, he breathed in and out, and the energy faded. He looked down towards the ground, seeing Aizen stand there, like he didn't even want to fight. You're too cautious. Naruto thought, as he swung his blade downward with all the force he could muster. The air pressure impacted the ground, slashing the tiles apart while heading for Aizen. Aizen avoided the faint attack easily, jumping into the air backwards slightly. Naruto smiled, Aizen had taken the bait. Naruto rushed forward, his sonido allowing him to breach the distance between the two. Their blades clashed once again but this time Naruto had angled his blade so that the tip was pointed almost vertically, towards the ceiling. Such an action would almost certainly leave his defense weakened, but Naruto seemed to have something up his sleeve. Aizen raised an eyebrow, he certainly knew that Naruto was up to something. He then heard a low hissing noise coming from his opponent, and his eyes widened as an orange zero went off without any sort of warning whatsoever from the hand that was clutching Naruto's Sanpakuto. The Siro scuffed Aizen's clothes, but otherwise didn't harm him. He had pivoted his body while still remaining in his basic stance, so he didn't Shunpa away while the Siro went off. Naruto, do you understand why you'll never be able to defeat me? Aizen asked in the midst of battle. Naruto snorted at his opponent warily, before his eyes darted to the top left corner. Ah oh man, here he goes. Naruto thought. If you put all your hatred into beating me as your one final goal. I, as, dot ga, b. Aizen began, as Naruto tuned him out completely. From the little bits of the speech he heard, Aizen seemed to be talking about how his hatred was just a petty excuse, and he was scared of something greater than him. Dot a. Shut. The fuck. Up. Naruto roared pouring all his strength into his sword and pushing Aizen off of him. The former captain slid back in mid-air, though he regained that smug smile of his. Do my words anger you, Naruto? Naruto smirked. No, you see, I wasn't paying attention to anything you were saying, so I didn't catch any of that. I was just thinking that your voice is just so annoying, and I already have to deal with looking at your ugly face all day. I don't need a voice to match it. He taunted. Aizen wasn't phased. 
It makes sense that you will be angered. Those who are weaker don't understand the strength of one who is superior are very quick to fall to fear and anger when they are forced to react to them. It is a flaw of any living creature. He mused, though Naruto wasn't paying attention again. Clate, Pyuto, he said, launching the other Siro that he had charged up earlier. Aizen sidestepped the thing, then flashed underneath Naruto's guard. Perhaps we should finish the weak attacks and move on to something bigger. His hand flashed with purplish black energy, which spiraled around his arm. Had in number 90, Kurohitsuji, he said, as a black box of Ryatsu surrounded Naruto. Without an incantation, it was at a mere third of its power, but Naruto was still trapped behind it. Naruto growled for a second as he was encased behind the Ryatsu, cutting off his opponent and light from entering the coffin. After that, he smirked and charged up energy into his hand. Rayo Bala. He said, as he charged up a Bala. He released the thin beam of orange light, which nailed the walls of the Kurohitsuji, and due to the superior Ryatsu of the Rayo Bala, cut right through the Kido. Aizen heard the whirring noise of the Bala from underneath the Kurohitsuji, and he hopped out of the way as it was cut through by the laser Bala, which continued to draw a line across the floor and up the wall, nearly splitting it in half. The structure of the Kido collapsed into basic Ryatsu, and Naruto emerged as a shadow out of the coffin, completely unharmed. He clutched his Zanpakuto tightly, pointing a finger at Aizen. He launched another Rayo Bala straight towards Aizen, who obviously flashed out of the way of the direct attack. Naruto smirked wider, bringing his finger around as if he were drawing a line. Aizen reappeared in midair, just before Naruto was done drawing his path of destruction up the walls. Aizen grunted as he saw the incoming Bala, flashing down to a safe place. It was exactly what Naruto wanted him to do. Too slow, he shouted, as he flashed directly into Aizen's blind spot as he reappeared on the steps leading up to the portal to Karakura Town. Aizen had enough time to turn his head. His eyes widened substantially as he realized that Naruto's finger was pointed directly at him. In exactly a split second, Naruto had fired another Rayo Bala from his finger. The ray of light burned a hole straight in Aizen's shoulder before coming out of the other side. Naruto immediately withdrew his Rayo Bala to go on the offensive, not giving Aizen even the slightest chance to react. Their blades met for the umpteenth time, but Naruto was going to press the offensive this time. Aizen just barely blocked his first strike, so Naruto could continue the attack. While parrying Aizen's blow, Naruto's free hand shot clenched into a fist, and he punched the former captain with all his might. Aizen brought his blade up to block it, but Naruto simultaneously went through for a quick jab with his cutlass. Three consecutive strikes later, and Naruto had broken through Aizen's guard. While Aizen was disoriented by his heavy blows, Naruto rose his blade skyward, before he let loose with the strongest downward slash he could perform. Aizen's blade was broken in half by the strike, and a fatal wound was delivered from his shoulder all the way to his hip. His eyes widened and shook, and he looked down at his body in disbelief. How? He asked in shock, as he collapsed to his knees. His Zanpakuto clanged to the floor as his grip failed him, and his knees gave out on him as he collapsed, blood pouring from his open wound. Aizen breathed heavily, blood pouring from his mouth as well. Naruto looked upon him dispassionately, a frown marred on his face as Aizen died right before his eyes. Surprisingly, his grip tightened on his Sanpakuto. Who do you think you're playing, he asked, as he turned over to where the portal was. Cut the damn illusion. You ain't dead yet. Naruto said, pointing his blade at the apparent dead corpse of Aizen Susuk. He watched it intently, even as it broke into several mirror shards, signifying that it was an illusion the whole time. He rolled his eyes, and casually put his blade behind his back, blocking an incoming strike. How intriguing. You managed to pick out that that was an illusion. Tell me, have you finally made a breakthrough on breaking my shirkai, Naruto? Aizen asked, his voice coming from the real Aizen that was attacking Naruto from behind. Naruto growled. That's not it. You went down far too easy, fell for several simple tricks, and the manner in which you died was far too melodramatic. 
You were using Kyuka Suijetsu the entire time in our fight, though it seems, he looked over to the center of the room. That was really Tosin who died. He mused. You are correct. I in no way used Kyuka Suijetsu on Kanin. The one that Okuyora fought was real, Aizen explained, though Naruto wasn't convinced. Well, it looks like I'll have to find out for myself. Naruto shouted, as he broke the contact with Aizen and slid back across the room. He reached into the collar of his Erenkar uniform, unbuttoning it completely and allowing his chest to be shown. Scattered all over his chest were a series of round devices that seemed connected to both each other and the rest of his body. They were the grey color of metal, with a flat, yet round shape with a green center. The veins on his chest were engorged with blood, as an unknown result of the pieces. There were seven of them in total, but Naruto pulled back some of his blonde spikes to reveal two more just above his forehead, for a total of nine pieces. They appeared to lie dormant for the time being, not serving any purpose that could be seen with the naked eye. Oh, hey, what are these? Naruto asked, pointing to one of the devices on his chest. Aizen frowned at them, but Naruto covered his chest back up partially. He touched one of the devices on his chest, pumping some of his Ryoku into it. The green core of the device lit up brightly, before the others began to follow suit. His engorged veins glowed with what seemed to be a toxic green Ryatsu, connecting the devices on his chest and head in a sort of green stream of Ryatsu that ran underneath his skin. And, I'm all set, Naruto said. For what exactly? Aizen asked, raising an eyebrow. I'm well aware of what you've been doing with Sail Aporo behind the scenes. You've been looking for a way to bypass my Kyuka Suijetsu's illusions using that invention that Sail Aporo made. You must know about the mechanics of my Kyuka Suijetsu by now, so I'll explain, Aizen started. Naruto's eyes widened, the jig was up. You know by now that Kyuka Suijetsu's effect is triggered by my sword release. To go further than that, once I release my Shirkai, I am allowed to control the five senses of my target to create absolute hypnosis. But, what about the details, to that? Aizen asked. When my target looks about Kyuka Suijetsu, a bit of my Ryatsu is released into their brain. This wavelength of Ryatsu directly controls the five senses, with my Shirkai the trigger, to allow that to happen without the imprinted Ryatsu, my illusions would be nothing more than simple Ryatsu. The imprint of Ryatsu on the brain needs to be in synchronization with my Zanpakuto in order to produce an illusion. I'm impressed. Because my Espada have been consistently exposed to my Zanpakuto, this was a create deal of opportunity for Sail Aporo to figure out the qualities of my Zanpakuto, unlike Soul Society. If my observations were correct, that device that you are connected to disrupts the wavelength of Ryatsu that has remained in your brain ever since you first saw my Kyuka Suijetsu, Aizen explained. Because I have no feedback from your senses, and my Ryatsu imprint cannot control you, I cannot create any illusions. However, he smirked, as Naruto jumped backwards, already on guard. Shatter, Kyuka Suijetsu. Aizen said. Naruto's eyes widened at the change in the Ryatsu. The Ryatsu that his system was suppressing had reverted to the feeling of beforehand. He looked up, and Aizen was gone. He felt a sharp pain come from his backside, and he turned away to see a heavy gash wound spilling blood from beyond his shoulder. Aizen was standing right there. Shit, he said, as he swung his blade at him. Aizen gasped at the blade slashed straight through his torso, but Aizen dissolved into more shattered glass. An illusion. Fog materialized around Naruto, and he looked around for an escape. Clones of Aizen materialized out of the fog, and Naruto looked from side to side. The clones did nothing, but despite that it felt like he was being run through by the real Aizen. No one has ever said that it is impossible for me to remove the Ryatsu imprint on your brain and place a completely new one there, one that your system cannot nullify, Aizen said. Naruto gritted his teeth so hard that they almost cracked underneath the pressure. Aizen had seen through his plan, but he forced himself to remain calm. He still had a trick up his sleeve. I also happen to know about the other trick that those devices are made to perform. You were surprisingly thorough with this plan, Naruto, 
Covering all your bases by having a backup plan was far more than I expected from an errand car like you. Aizen commented, as Naruto tinkered with one of the devices on his chest. They seemed to be changing color, and the intensity of the Riatsu underneath Naruto's skin increased. You can adjust the power of that device in order to respond to the output of Riatsu that I decide to release from my Zanpakuto in order to create illusions. If I had truly not known about your capacity for that, I would most likely be defeated here. However, he said. Naruto grinned as he tinkered with one of the knobs on his chest, and felt the right Riatsu burst forth from them. Aizen appeared to him from the side, and Naruto threw a careless punch over to him. Incidentally, Aizen broke out into mirror parts. I have already prepared for that. In order to combat your device, I have broken free of my reliance on the ritual. I may now confuse the senses of anyone I please, regardless of whether or not they have seen the release of my Zanpakuto. I truly must thank you, Naruto. You have played a most important role in advancing my evolution. It was an illusion. It truly is intriguing, Naruto. You spent so much of your time figuring out how to defeat my Shirkai, but when you finally seem to have achieved that goal, you are utterly defeated. Any flawed living creature would see the unfairness of such an event. But, perhaps this is just another limitation of a living creature. The fact that I was victorious means that a higher being has decided for us who shall be the victor, and who shall be the loser. But, soon I will break those limitations, and will no longer be subject to those higher beings, Aizen said, the voice seemingly coming from nowhere. Why isn't it working? Sale and I tested this for years, to make sure it would work. Aizen broke his reliance on the ritual. Is that even possible? The whole basis of his shirkai was on that. Does that mean that this system of Riatsu control is useless? Those questions exploded into Naruto's mind as he desperately tried to tune the system to work. Aizen's voice was coming from somewhere he couldn't pinpoint, and it even might be an illusion in itself. Without even using Shuenpa, Aizen appeared in front of Naruto. Naruto rose to his feet, almost forgetting the important device on his chest as he would be forced to fight Aizen without it. Aizen stood there for a moment, his blade not even out. Instead, it was sheathed completely, and Aizen didn't even look like he was ready to fight. Naruto fell into a defensive stance. He was slashed cleanly through the torso. His eyes widened and shook as he looked down on the deep and serious sword wound that ran down from his shoot to just above his hip. He fell to his knees, breathing heavily. He turned his head around, seeing Aizen standing around 15 feet behind him, his sword pointed horizontally and covered with his blood. Aizen had used an illusion, and gotten through his guard immediately. Aizen turned around, before the Primera Espada collapsed onto the ground, struggling to remain conscious. Jin's smirk widened on the sidelines, and he shook his head. Aha, he should have expected this sort of outcome. That's what happens when anyone tries to fight ya, Aizen Taishu. He said cryptically, before Aizen turned and regarded him. It means nothing, we have enough Aaron cars to fight the Soul Society with. Even without our strongest one, we are more than prepared for this battle. But, he said, pointing to Ulquiora. I'm afraid I can't forgive you, Ulquiora. You have attacked and killed Kanaim, this insubordination cannot go unpunished, Aizen said. Ulquiora stared blankly at him, before putting his hands in his uniform. Aizen turned to look at the portal, the Shinigami had apparently made their way to the battlefield, if what the blurry display of the Gangantesque portal was true. He turned back to Ulquiora. Now, shall we? Aizen was cut off as a cutlass-like Zanpakuto stabbed through him from behind. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you enjoyed this what if and want to see next part of it, comment down below and let me know. Also share this video with your friends. See you in the next video. Peace.